Hi everybody, uh, I'm going to do a baseball painting today. So, a nice sphere with lots of little details. I'm painting it in my box uh, with the clamp light on it, so we'll take a look at that. So, I had to paint this for you guys to get to a point where we could do details for today's or tomorrow's lesson. So, I figured I might as well record this part. So, we're starting with our fill here. I do paint this fast. Um, so remember when we are doing our fill, start with your shadow for one, like I did already. And we wanna break every object into four different values and pieces of the anatomy of this, the shape we're painting. Uh, those four pieces are shadow, light, midtone, and penumbra. Penumbra is a weird one. That it's a darker midtone that is in between the midtone and the shadow, and it's a transition from light to shadow. It's very important. It always exists, no matter how hard it is to see. Other pieces of our still life, um, I will put in a cast shadow. That's the shadow that's on the floor that's coming off the baseball. Form shadow is the darker part on the actual baseball. Now, a mindset with our fill is simplified shapes. So notice I'm putting in these little red marks that are the stitches of the baseball, but I'm not getting into big details about them. Just kind of a real general note of where they're gonna exist. They're actually not even in the right place as I watch my video, but that's okay, that's, it's the fill. So with your fills, I do want you to be accurate. You know, accuracy equals speed long-term. Um, but, you know, you can give up some, some perfection with your fill, and it's not going to wreck your painting. Now, as I get the uh, background in, um, and the cast shadow and the rest of this painting, I apologize, there's a little bit of a glare. I do correct the glare uh, when I cut past the fill and take my camera down to check. So, bear with the glare for a minute, it'll go away. Uh, so anyway, putting background in. Jump ahead. I am that fast. I'm putting, you know, the the wall in the distance and, you know, I'm starting to form, okay? So we jump from our fill to forming. So this is where I'm doing the little cross hatches that go across our four values of the fill. Now remember, when I tell you guys to fill with four values, there's more values than that on every object, especially spheres like this baseball. So imagine there's a thousand different values, or it's infinite really, but you know, I am using the different piles of paint at different values and just kind of doing that zigzag blend. So I'm cross hatching, going perpendicular to the fill lines I created or per perpendicular to the direction of the light. Um, and I'm using a pretty small brush, you know, just kind of cross hatching, taking it slowly. Uh, you know, I'm adjusting from things that I think need to be lighter or darker. So this is the longest part of painting, you know, this forming phase. Notice with the baseball, the whole reason I'm doing this uh, to lead to tomorrow, today's or tomorrow's live demo, whenever you watch this, um, is so I can do details, but I'm really ignoring them. The most important thing about this baseball is that it's a sphere first. I gotta make sure it's very round. Then, you know, when I feel very confident that it's three-dimensional and I can almost grab it, you know, that's when I'm going to dive into little details on the stitches and all the really fun texture of a worn baseball. You know, I'm pushing the, the white up into the stitches a little bit there. I'm, I'm, that's a drawing problem that I'm fixing. So when we're forming, mostly we're rendering, which means just smoothing out the lines, blending, but I'm also always willing to change drawing errors, value errors, any errors, anything that is not feeling right. And I know with all my step-by-step -step things, you know, sometimes you guys get a little worrisome about like, okay, which steps next, what do I do? I mean, really this forming phase is just keep observing. Okay, so when you're watching me or any artist doing these time-lapse videos, Remember, we're looking very hard at the object we're painting. We're observing it. That's like one of the most important things. 
Um, so, you know, in class and learning, you know, we're talking a lot, saying fix this, fix that. Your mind kind of wanders around with what's not correct. Remember all this, you're going to grow from just painting and just observing. So, yeah, I give you guys particular projects for particular lessons and to grow at a certain pace. But I can't recommend highly enough that you got to just kind of look at things and paint. Even draw, you know, if, we're, if you don't have enough time to break out all the paint or the palette, you know, it's just observing lines, observing form, observing light. Uh, so there's my rant for the day for doing your homework. Um, let's talk a little bit about the color of the baseball as I'm forming it here. Now, those three words I always use, the three dimensions of color, are hue, value, and chroma. All right? So the values, how light or dark certain shapes are, that's what's given this baseball form to feel three-dimensional. So the fact that I got a darker shadow on the ball, um, then that penumbra gets a little lighter, then the midtone gets a little lighter, and then the light to the baseball gets lighter. Those are all value things. That's what makes it feel round. Uh, hue is really what color, the layman people would say, what color is it? You know, examples of hue are yellow, red, orange, blue. Um, and those can all be organized. You know, there there's more than one blue, there's more than one green. So we'll get into that as we go. Chroma is the saturation or the intensity of that color. All right. So for this particular painting, I, you know, I showed my palette at the beginning of the video here. The prepared palette I used for this painting, uh, I mixed a version of orange, so I combined a lot of stuff. I combined yellow ochre and orange for that seven value, and then I made it the two value raw umber and burnt umber. So that made a mix of in between yellow and orange. Then I used ultramarine blue and white for the blue part. I had gray up there because I was showing one of you guys a gray, ver a gray lesson anyway, but you could use them all. But remember, orange and blue do uh, neutralize each other's chroma. They lower the chroma when you mix them together. So really, besides a little bit of red for those stitches, um, this whole painting is this in-between yellow and orange that I made and blue. All right, and that works because the whole still life is really like a mid-chroma. You know, because I have that cardboard box that it's sitting in, and the baseball's low chroma, really, besides the red stitches. Um, so I didn't need to be as stressed about very chromatic colors. And that's honestly one of the reasons I mixed the ochre into the cadmium orange to begin with. One, I did that because of a hue reason. The whole cardboard box and the baseball really were in between orange and yellow. It was not all the way yellow, was not all the way orange. Also, just knowing the uh, properties of each pigment, yellow ochre and raw umber are a lower chroma pigment to begin with in comparison to your cadmium. So in comparison to cadmium orange, when I put that ochre in, it shifted the hue. It shifted the cadmium orange towards yellow, and it lowered the chroma. So then when I did all this pushing and pulling of blue into my little yellow-orange mix, my chroma was already getting knocked down. So it gives me this feeling of cardboard and like a beat-up old baseball. So it worked for this particular painting. That's why I'm so, I stress those three dimensions of color so much. So you guys can paint anything. If you love really high chroma flowers, you got to understand where high chroma is. If you love low chroma Andrew Wyeth, you got to understand where low chroma is. Um, so remember, there's three prop, uh, dimensions of color, hue, value, and chroma. Now, staying with the palette, you know, notice I mixed strings of those colors, those hues, the orange, yellow, and the blue. Those strings, I mean, I sat down and said, what hues am I painting? And I made it, you know, I made what, I forget already, three different piles of paint. I didn't, did not do all 11 values. So those of you that are starting out with me, all 11 values exist, more than that exists. You know, you will get to a point where you'll know how many values you need. 
But the basic theory is I did prepare my palette before I sat down and started painting. So then I could just draw and observe and render. So, you know, go ahead and form in all these details and get to a certain point where I can be certain that this object is feeling round and the, you know, the box feels like it has light. So I'm doing those principles of, you know, what we see three dimensions before we get into any details. So as this painting is moving along on the video, I'm kind of carving up the drawing of the baseball. I am painting at an awful angle that I don't like to do just for you guys to see this better. So I will probably still make this more round tomorrow. But anyway, I'm, I am fixing the roundness of the baseball. I'm working on the cast shadow um, and the background and the nuances because I feel like the baseball is, you know, far enough along. I still may do some stuff to it before I do details. But, you know, I'm getting the surrounding environment in. You know, notice in the cast shadow how it is darkest right under the baseball, closest to the object. And as that cast shadow falls away from the object, it gets a little lighter in value and a little bit fuzzier edge. Notice how all my edges are pretty soft. You know, this is the time to do it. I know uh, I nag you guys a lot about that and... You know, I kind of leave it towards the end because I want you to get good at forming. Um, and you don't get good at forming any other way than doing it and practicing it. So you got to keep practicing. Uh, but that's why I kind of leave uh, the softening the edges towards the end of class. Um, when you get in the habit and feeling comfortable about forming things, you know, it's good to soften your edges at this point when everything's wet. You know, I'm still going to do details on top of this baseball, but at least my edges are soft and I don't have to go back there and, and do them again when the paint's starting to dry. Um, I don't know why I did a little extra detail on the back of the cardboard box. It just kind of was in the mood for a little interest. Um, it's a nice little compositional thing to have something else there. Um, how do I know that? You know, just from painting and from gut, you know, there's a line there, keeps the viewer's eye back down to the baseball. Um, so that's why I decided to do something a little irregular up there. But I also wanted to show you guys that real subtle little shifts back there on that cardboard box help the light effect of the whole painting. You know, the fact that it, the cardboard box has a little divot of overlapping cardboard pieces gives me a chance to put a couple extra cast shadows and, um some extra, you know, nuance of light back there. Uh, so it just kind of adds to the realism. There would be nothing wrong if I just did the baseball, but this is just like a little something else to create a world. Uh, I debated putting the baseball in, in the sky with a nice blue sky just to emphasize the orange and blue. Uh, but I've done a painting like that before and I didn't want to repeat it. But, you know, I figured I'd stay true to the still life and show you guys you can incorporate this box, you can, you know, do as many little details of your own still lifes as you want, um, all from just having control of your paint and observing. So I'll get through this box and I'll kind of finish up filling in the rest of the ground and all that stuff. Um, you know, at some point I put the stitches on the baseball and they're really not too accurate right now. But it gave me a little map of when I go through them in the live demo, I'll have a good map to kind of go through the nuances and details. Um, so I needed to get some sort of pattern down there. Um, you know, I did add a little extra chroma back into this layer. It was feeling a little dead. So I just kind of went back to more pure it's not pure, but that yellow ochre and cad orange mix to add a little bit more of a glow into this box. Um, my original thought was, oh, I'll knock the box's chroma down and make sure the, the ball comes forward in, in chroma, but really the baseball just is low chroma. Um, you know, I wasn't going to be able to fight it besides the red stitches, so I brought a little bit of the true glow of the cardboard back. Um, I should have painted this painting on cardboard. That would have been interesting. Um, 
But anyway, hopefully this is helpful for you guys. And uh, watch this, and we'll jump in tomorrow. So here's a little close-up, and uh, thanks for watching. Fell for and finish. Bye.